On June 30th of 1971, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory debuted in theaters. Roald Dahl, who wrote the book it was based on, as well as the original screenplay, absolutely hated the film for a variety of reasons. These reasons included changes made to his work, the focus on Willy Wonka instead of Charlie, and the casting of Gene Wilder. And at first, the film wasn't much of a success at all. It barely made back its budget. But in the years following, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory would slowly become one of cinema's greatest cultural touchstones. Several popular airings on TV and its VHS release in 1984 made it a formative movie in a lot of people's childhoods, some in more bizarre ways than others. For a lot of people, the most consequential scene was the one in which Violet, after snatching Willy Wonka's gum and chewing on it despite his warnings, turns into a big blueberry. Her skin becomes blue and she inflates like a balloon, and then she's rolled away by the Oompa Loompas. In the book, she explodes and dies, but you can't put that in a kid's movie. For most viewers, this is just a silly gag and a little bit of a moral lesson, but for some, it was their first exposure to body horror, leaving them to mentally fill in the gruesome details of Violet's fate. But for some viewers, this scene opened up their mind to a world of exciting possibilities, shaping their predilections through adulthood. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be talking about body inflation fetishists. This video is sponsored by Raycon. When I was a kid, around this time of year, you'd start to see all the back to school commercials on TV. And it'd make me miserable because they didn't want to go back to school. However, it was still fun to buy a bunch of crap. And you know what? I'm not in school anymore, but I can still buy stuff, so it's even better now. And you know what's an absolute must-have for me this fall? Raycon's best-selling everyday earbuds, of course. I know you've heard me talk about Raycon's everyday earbuds before and thought, wait a minute, what do you mean the same audio quality you expect from the big guys, but at half the price? Well, now's the best time to check them out, as they've recently launched their new upgraded model. I've been using Raycon earbuds for years now, when I'm going on walks or I'm at the gym, and this is the third pair that I've had. So I can honestly say that this is the biggest leap in audio quality since they started. They also feature an improved ergonomic design, multi-point connectivity, and active noise cancellation. The quick charge function is also a lifesaver. Just 10 minutes of charging gives you 90 minutes of playtime. Just click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash wang. You'll get 20 to 40% off your Raycon purchase, plus free shipping. I think when most people hear the word fetish, they think about BDSM. You know, whips and rope and leather and whatnot. But that's just scratching the surface, of course. I'm sure that you, as a viewer of this channel, have come across much stranger stuff. I'm not even talking about, like, more extreme fetishes. Stuff like poo or pee, or getting your dick flattened. I'm talking about stuff that's generally harmless, but it's so absurdly specific that you're like, how did someone even come to realize that they're into this? For example, you got war. <sighs> where someone gets off on being swallowed whole by a giant carnivorous plant, or by Bowser or something. You got, I don't even know what the name for this is. There's, the people want to have, like, alien eggs laid inside of them. They even got, like, these alien dick toys that they spit out dissolving eggs. One of the funniest ones to me is body inflation, where a person gets partially or entirely inflated like a balloon. Like, you picked up that balloon power up in Super Mario World. Which, there's probably some people who were playing that game back in the day, and they were like, wait a second, this is working for me. But in the way that Sally Acorn or Lola Bunny were a lot of people's furry awakenings, it seems like the genesis for the inflation fetish for a lot of people was that scene from Willy Wonka. In fact, this scene even led to a more specific genre, blueberry porn. You even got like this one dude, Cody Sprayberry, who has a whole blueberry only fans. But for the people who found their souls touched by that Willy Wonka scene, it generally manifested in more of a, a general interest in the idea of blowing up. They were more interested in that than the fruit. But of course, Willy Wonka came out all the way back in 1971. You didn't have terminally online internet fetish people in 1971. To paraphrase a very poignant post that was once made on 4chan, back in the old days before the internet, you might think, hey, maybe I want to fuck a toaster. Your friends make fun of you for it, and that's the end of it. After the internet, you think, hey, maybe I want to fuck a toaster. Then you go online and find the greater toaster fetishist community, and that's your life now. It all seems like a very modern phenomenon, because we all have some sense of that, but the inflation community actually goes back way further than I would have guessed. In the fall of 2008, the British magazine Forum interviewed a man who goes by the name Inflate123. As one of the founding members of the community, he gives a lot of insight into how the community was formed and how these communities form in general. 
He began to think about inflation after having a dream as a child where he turned into a balloon and floated helplessly up into the sky. And he mentioned that an aspect that he finds appealing about all this is the helplessness to stop or control the inflation, something that the interview compared to a sub-dom dynamic. In 1994, after he moved into his own place and had more privacy, he started looking for inflation content to scratch that itch. And he found that there was basically nothing, so he began to look around for posts by like-minded people. He found a person on Usenet talking about a movie with an inflatable corset. He also found some people making posts about erotic elements of balloons and various types of inflatables. He started reaching out to these people, and eventually he had himself a mailing list of about 12 people. This was the early inflation fetish community. Within a year, it ballooned into about 200 people. But the thing is, as I suspected when I started working on this video, inflation is really a bunch of similar but different fetishes that are caught under the same umbrella. You can notice how different artists focus on different aspects of blowing up. For example, Inflate told the interviewer that a big draw of it for him is seeing the natural human form expanded. Like you might like big boobs, but what if they were even bigger, blown up like a balloon? And he also said that to some extent, his partner's implants feed into this fetish. There's also some people that want to see the inflated person pop, while there's others that are strongly opposed to it. We split off into different groups based on specific interests that had cropped up as common themes. Lunars, breast expansion, body inflation, and pool toys slash vinyl animals. Everyone was friendly, but it became clear that there was enough diversity that we should each set up camps and stay in touch. At the time of the interview, Inflate was making a website called Airy Tales. It collected some stories from the community, including things like Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood and how she became not so little, and Goldilocks and the Three Heirs. Like a lot of communities in the pre-social media era, it was more spread across a bunch of websites maintained by individuals. For instance, another interesting site I came across was bodyinflation.org, which was made by Luther Kane in 1997, and still exists to this very day. Features on the original website include art of celebrities inflated, including people like Tiffany Amber Thiessen, Soleil Moonfry, Cindy Crawford, and Courtney Cox. It also had a list of movies with inflation scenes. Aside from the obvious Willy Wonka scene, you got stuff like Killer Clowns from Outer Space, 1988. In one scene, the guys who drive the ice cream truck fall through a trapdoor in the clown's spaceship. They fall into a pit of plastic balls. On the edge of the pit sit two female alien clowns whose breasts inflate. The female clowns are butt ugly, just letting you know. I guess this is like their version of rubbing one out to the Sears catalog. Back to the Inflate 123 interview, he mentioned something else that's a big part of the community. He purchased an inflatable cat suit from a company named Cocoon. He mentions that it wasn't really what he was looking for. There just wasn't enough feeling of that internal pressure as it inflated. Although Inflate was unhappy with his purchase, there were some people with better access to better stuff. In fact, these kinds of suits were the specialty of perhaps the most well-known member of the community, at least in the mainstream consciousness. Of course, I'm speaking of the one and only Mr. Blowup. Although none of his several official websites appear to have been archived well enough to browse, a lot of his story can be gathered through various publications. In August of 2000, The Guardian attended the London Fetish Fair, where their reporter Nick Barley spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Blowup. In the article, they're described as rubber fetishists, and it doesn't really go into the idea of inflation at all, just that they're web designers who had been in the scene for 25 years at that point. Although in one quote taken from him, Mr. Blowup does echo inflate one 2 3 sentiments about the lack of resources in the early days. You couldn't get the stuff in shops. There were no clubs and very few magazines. Now there are more shops in the UK than almost anywhere else. A few years later, BBC would take a closer look at him. We get to see him at home using some of his suits with the help of his wife. And we also see pictures of his friends who are also in on the fetish. He mentions that his interest developed in childhood. I think we had a, a sort of plastic beach ball at home and my friends had these inflatable paddling pools and I found those very interesting and I often wondered uh, what it would be like to, to sort of get inside something like that or, or have an outfit that, that inflated. Like Inflate123, he also found that he was seeking the pressure from the inflation suits. He says it's relaxing in a way to unwind. I'm uh, in a sort of fetal position in here, sitting on the floor with my knees up under my chin and my arms around my legs. And like Inflate, he also found his community through the early internet. We even get a glance at his website at the time. It's funny, pretty much every friend I've shown this clip to while working on this video had more or less the same reaction. They're expecting to laugh at some creepy weirdo, but then they're kind of taken aback by this gentle, soft-spoken man who was lucky enough to find a supportive group of friends. It's still funny to watch him blow up, though. 
A much more in-depth look at Mr. Blow Up was given in an article he wrote for Secret Magazine at some point in the early 2000s. He mentions that he's 43 years old and lives with his wife just outside of London. Rubber fetishism is just one of his interests, which also include things like reading, music, travel, and preserved railways. And the interest in railways actually makes a lot of things make sense. In this article, he once again mentions the relaxing nature of the inflatables. I mentioned that at times, his wife has used his suits not as a fetish device, but as a way to stay focused while reading. He also speaks about how until he met his wife somewhat recently, none of his several previous girlfriends were interested in engaging with the rubber fetish at all. In fact, Mrs. Blowup not only just tolerated his interest, she helped nurture it, helping him build a growing collection of inflatables. So listen, if a rubber fetishist in his 40s can finally meet his perfect match, there's no reason to sell for less. In fact, within a short while of meeting her, we were attending the fetish clubs and events in London. We have quite a large collection of rubber now, ranging from conventional items like vests and shorts, up to cat suits of various types and colors, two long capes, a rubber maid's dress, two long dresses, and red and black high-heeled rubber boots. Our bed has a black rubber sheet on it, with two rubber pillowcases. We also have, of course, the inflatables, including an inflatable total enclosure body bag, several hoods, and a catsuit. He also spoke about how he's modified some of the devices and his goals of making his own, although budget concerns were limiting him at the time. He concludes the article by looking towards the future. As for the future years, as a married man, I now have other priorities, such as the maintenance of a house and two cars, and the purchase of computer equipment for our web design consultancy which means that I cannot spend as much time as I'd like in our rubber collection. Like thousands of other people in England, we firmly believe that one day we'll win the lottery jackpot. Unlike them, however, we won't squander our money on houses or cars. We'll spend it sensibly on the most comprehensive collection of rubber things my imagination can dream up, probably making a few suppliers very rich as well. Overall, he just seems like a really nice guy with a strange but harmless fixation. I've kind of noticed this to be a thing sometimes with these kinds of stories. Like, you'll assume someone's gonna be some kind of deranged maniac, but having found their peace in life against all odds, they are strangely well adjusted. Unfortunately, I found a Flickr post from September 15th, 2020, posted by Lula in memoriam of Mr. Blowup. The person who posted this appears to be a part of the community who would know what's going on, so I think it's likely that Mr. Blob did indeed pass away. He would have been about 60 years old at the time. Now, going back to the idea that inflation is a collection of similar but different fetishes under the same umbrella, I think that what Mr. Inflate does isn't exactly what a lot of people think of when we hear about inflation. In a lot of ways, it's kind of the opposite. While he was seeking to feel the pressure coming in on him from the outside and kind of have the inflatable squeeze him, what I usually picture when I hear about this is people getting inflated from the inside out. Usually like Sonic the Hedgehog or some random persona. In fact, I want to say like 99% of the inflation stuff I've ever seen was furries. Which it seems a little bit odd considering that the Willy Wonka scene has absolutely nothing to do with furries or animals of any kind. When looking into this phenomenon, I actually came across a post on r slash furry. Why are inflation and fecal related fetishes the most popular on sites like FA? It seems like every three pictures on Fur Affinity, there is an inflation picture, a vor picture, a fat belly picture, a diaper picture, or a shit picture. I am just curious. I never see this kind of fetish anywhere else on any kind of site but on furry sites. The inflation feces related fetishes run rampant. I mean, go look for yourself. Go to browse and there are probably at least four inflation or diaper pictures. I'm just curious as to why these fetishes slash drawing style slash interests seem to line up with the furry community. I personally find it a little weird for relatively cool furries to be painting pictures of otherwise beautiful fursonas, but then ruin it with a poopy diaper or a huge belly. I don't understand. Can someone explain? An explanation was given by a user named Cultsar. I can give a possible explanation for the inflation stuff. Fur Affinity was started by a fur who was into inflation. It was advertised as an alternative to other art sites where that sort of thing wasn't very well received. So much of the early community was into inflation. It still has a surprisingly large inflation community on the site. So as I understand it, Fur Affinity was originally a bit of a containment zone for furries with weird fetishes. But eventually, they just vastly outgrew all the people they are being contained from. It makes sense that such a large website would be able to shape the culture like that. 
But I also think there's another reason. Furries are famously the greatest art patrons of our time. A lot of artists who aren't furries and have no interest in that stuff have openly admitted that it's basically rich furries who are keeping the lights on. And this sort of inflation can basically only ever be depicted in art, because you can't do it in real life without dying. There's been several cases of accidental deaths throughout the world where someone got air inside of them and croaked. I recently covered one of these incidents in a short, in which an Indian factory worker's insides ruptured when his boss blew compressed air up his butt as a joke. And there are countless incidents like this around the world. You might think, oh, it's just air, but you can do some real damage with it. That being said, though, I did come across one man who inflated like this and survived. Steve McCormack was a truck driver from New Zealand. At 48 years old, his career had mostly been without incident. But in an instant, a freak accident had people saying he was lucky to be alive. On May 21st of 2011, while on his route traveling through the town of Opotiki, Stephen fell between the cab and trailer of his truck. He landed onto the air hose, breaking it. As he landed, the hose was still pumping air, and its brass nozzle tore into his butt cheek, and it began to actually inflate his butt. <laughs> I know this sounds like someone's fetish story that they wrote, but this is a real thing that happened. He described what it felt like to a local publication, the Wakatane Beacon. I felt the air rush into my body, and I felt like it was going to explode from my foot. I was blowing up like a football. I felt like I had the bends, like in diving. I had no choice but to just lay there blowing up like a balloon. The nozzle had positioned itself where it was just inside his skin and his muscle tissue. It wasn't inside his gut or any part of the digestive system, which is what killed all those other guys. It was agonizing, separating his fat from his muscle, and it took his body days to deflate, leaving his skin in a condition that he compared to a roast pork. And there's probably aspects of this that sound like a dream to this brand of inflation fetishist, but I imagine the pain and likely permanent injuries would be a lot more than they'd bargain for, even with the prospect of surviving the ordeal. Like, I'm sure there's probably, like, maybe, like, two or three people coming across this video that are actual inflation fetishes, and they're hearing that story for the first time and writing it down in their notebook. D don't try this on purpose. Please. But anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, turn on notifications and check out my video about the guy who made a life-size Princess Sally doll with a skeleton inside of it. I'm out.